Good evening and welcome to New Life. I'm Terry Knight, the pastor here at New Life Community Church, and I thank you so much for turning us on, tuning us in. I trust, as always, that the Lord's going to bless you up one side and down the other as we fellowship together here for the next several moments. We began a teaching last week that deals with the issue of following after Christ. And I want to suggest to you, we have been suggesting to you through this teaching, that saying you're a Christian or a follower of Christ means something. But what does that look like? Perhaps you are of the younger generation, and that would be anybody under the age of 56. And in particular, if you're uh, in your teen years, you may have read the Bible at some point in time and come away scratching your head like, man, what does that look like? I see these pictures in the Bible. My grandmother's Bible's got a picture of some dudes walking around with robes. What's that all about? What does it look like today to be a follower of Christ? Well, certainly has very little to do with dudes walking around in robes. But uh, let's see if we can find out what it does look like. Go with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, I want to read about three verses in your hearing. Then we're going to go right to this teaching. The record puts it this way. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. A couple of key phrases there, make disciples and teaching them to obey. That is a key component of what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. Pray with me. Lord, I thank you for every man, woman, boy, and girl that's turned on this program tonight, whether they're old or young or somewhere in between. Perhaps they're tuning in tonight for the very first time. Maybe they're regular viewers of New Life Telecast. Regardless, I pray that you'd help us to understand what it looks like in this day and age to follow you, to live a lifestyle of holiness, following after your word. We pray, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, you be blessed. I'll be back here in just a little while to wrap things up. God bless. That stretch of time, these ones were able to spend some seriously quality time in relationship with a walking around Jesus. So he said, hey guys, come on. I'm going to show you some things. Watch me. Do what I do. Let me help you with this. Any questions? Let me paint you a picture. Let me tell you some stories to help. We call them parables. But he tell them some stories. And that's the way Jesus taught. That's kind of the way the Hebrews learn. Now the Greeks come along and mess that up. But the, the Hebrews get it that we have, have to see little pictures sometimes. And that's what Jesus did. Number six on your study notes. For about three years, 36 months. 150 some weeks, Jesus did OJT with these fisher men. Somebody tell me what OJT is. On the job training. Do you like it better when somebody says to you, hey you, I want you to do something you've never done before. Or hey you, I have something I want you to help me do. Maybe you've never done it before, but I'm going to show you how. You know, sometimes those of us who grew up in church, and by that I mean our parents were Christians, so they did the right thing and brought us to church with them. How many of you know when you grow up like that, it's, it's real easy to think that everybody grew up like that. I run into people all the time that tell me, I've never been to church. And they don't have a clue how to do this thing other than what maybe somebody told them that's off the wall. Somebody say off the wall. You understand what I mean by that? I'm not going to explain it right now. Maybe we'll preach on that one of these days. I can just see it now. A sermon on off the wall. How good would that be? Let me show you about Jesus and this on the job training. Go with me to John chapter 2. I promised you we were going there. John chapter 2, verse number 1. We are told, On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana 
in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, verse 2. And Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. We don't know who all was there, but we know that Jesus, Mother Mary, was there, his earthly guardian, Mary, his fleshly birth mother, Mary, was there. And we also know that his disciples had been invited. Now, you know the story. I trust you know the story. Uh, The wedding planner either messed up and had more guests uh, than planned for, or the guest drank too much. Not real sure and irrespective of the details, they ran out of punch. Say amen if you know what I'm talking about. They ran ran out of drink. So Jesus actually ended up turning some common water into some very fine wine. Not the cheap stuff. This was the good stuff. Now, I wouldn't know the difference between the two, to be honest with you. But uh, this was some good stuff. And then we read in John chapter 2, verse 11. This, the first of his miraculous signs, transforming water into good wine, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee. He thus revealed his glory. Look at this. And his disciples, and where were they? They were with him. They were at the wedding. His disciples put their faith in him. Can't you imagine while they were pouring that water from one container to the next, while they were stirring on that, and while they were pouring it out into the punch bowl, can't you just imagine that Jesus was looking over at some of his disciples going, can you dig what I'm saying? And and I, I am really stretching this, but I can just imagine it that he might have punched one of them and said, watch this. Watch this. I told you, come with me, watch me. I had some things to tell you and I had some things to show you. Watch this. Point. These guys were along for the lesson. You still with me? All right, let's go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6 verse 1 says, Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Verse 3, then Jesus went up on the hillside and sat down with his, say it, church, disciples. Who is he up on the hillside with? Pastor Harley? Jesus went up into the mountain. Say amen right there. Spent a lot of time up on the mountainside. He didn't just go up there by himself. Now, there was a lot of times where he went up there by himself. But on this particular occasion, he went up there and he sat down with his disciples. The disciples were with him. That which ensued was the famed feeding of the 5,000. Called the feeding of the 5,000 because the Bible indicates there were 5,000 men there aside from the women and children. Now, if you go back and read the account, you'll realize once again that Jesus strategically involved his disciples in this miracle. Look in John 6 and verse 12. When they had all had enough to eat. Can you imagine 5,000 people having enough to eat? We had about that many over to Jones' house last night for a small group. Had enough food for about 5,000, didn't we? I ate enough for 2,000. When they all had enough to eat, look at this. He said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them. Would you care to guess who they is? It's the disciples. They gathered them and filled, check it out, 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. You understand what's going on there? When it was all said and done, when everybody had been fed by two little biscuits and five little sardines and that Jesus multiplied in the power of the Spirit, he said to them, you go out and gather up all the pieces that's left over. And they brought back Each disciple, a basket full, not 10 baskets full, not 13 baskets full, but how many baskets full? 
12, one for each disciple. Can't you just imagine, and I'll tell you, I'm using some poetic license here, but can't you imagine those guys carried that around for days looking at that, thinking, man, that is the coolest thing right there I ever did see. They probably set that up on their mantle and looked at that for a couple of weeks. Talked about that with their wife and kids. You believe that? Man, lie and talk about what happened. That was a real, real lesson going on there. Now, told you that to tell you this. These scenarios, and the book of John is loaded with them. These scenarios played out in dramatic fashion for these fishers of men in training. I want to encourage you. Go back sometime and look at John, John in particular. Starting around chapter 12, somewhere around verse 20. Clean through the end of chapter 17, around verse 26 of chapter 17. Nearly all of that section of the scripture is in red. What does that mean, church? It's the words of Jesus. Highlight some very intimate truths that Jesus taught to those he beckoned to come and learn of him. Matthew even records for us these red words. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Just a few moments ago, I yoked up with young Tyler the Moscarello. Literally yoked up with him. Hooked up with him. You understand a yoke? Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. It's out there. He said, take the yoke. It won't just fall on you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Somebody say learn. Learn. Key word. Now, I'm trying to help you understand what Christ came to accomplish. We talk about the baby, Jesus. We talk about Christmas, Christ Mass, him leaving heaven and dwelling for a while among us. What did he come to do? Why did he come? Back in Matthew chapter 28, our text passage. The Bible tells us this in verse 18. And this is the very, very end. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Kind of the very end of Jesus' earthly ministry. We started at the beginning a little while ago. and We've walked you through some things. Now we're at the end. And here's what Jesus said. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. Jesus came. He called some people to him. He said, come on. Yoke up with me. I'm going to teach you how to do something. This is discipleship. I'm going to teach you how to be disciple and I'm going to teach you how to do that toward the end of you reaching some other people and helping them in the process of becoming a disciple which is discipleship is anybody with me this morning now how do we do that today how do we hook up with Jesus Jesus went back to heaven he's no longer walking on the earth right He sure did go back to heaven. Yes, he did. But check it out, church, and I trust you'll take great courage with this. He did not leave us empty-handed. He was talking to the disciples once upon a time in one of their little sessions where they got together, and he was just sharing some things with them, showing them some things, telling them some things. And he said to them, you can find this in John chapter 14, uh, that little red-letter section that I talked about. And he said, hey, guys, time's getting close. I got to go. And they're like, no, 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 please don't go. He said, I got to go. He said, you you need to understand this, gentlemen. It's necessary for you that I go. Because if I don't go, then you won't receive this other comforter that God has for you. If I go, he will send you another comforter. Watch this. He didn't say if I go, he will send you a comforter. He said another comforter. How many of you know that when you walk and talk with Jesus, and Jesus embraces you, and Jesus says some things to you, and Jesus shows you some things, that is comforting. He said, I'm going to send you another comforter. A little different than the other one, but another comforter nonetheless. Parakletos is the Greek 
word. Before you can have another, you've got to have the first one. Jesus was the first one. Holy Spirit was the second one. I'm going to send you guys Holy Spirit. Now watch this. Headed, I think, number seven on your study notes. Before these guys, Simon, Andrew, the other of the disciples, before they were actually any good at fishing for men, watch this. They walked and talked with Jesus after the call. Three years. Watched Jesus do all kind of things. But before they were really good at this fishing for men thing, there had to, to be something, something very necessary, take place on the inside of them. They had to become filled with the power source for evangelism, which is Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus told them about that as he got ready to, to go up and be with the Father. He told them again. You can read about this in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. It reflects back to the Gospels, and he wraps some things up. He says there's this power that's going to be given to you. It's a power to enable you to be a, become a witness. And we've looked at this before. And we've also looked at what I'm about to show you before. Now I want to look at it again. Immediately after this glorious infilling with the Holy Spirit. And beloved, I believe that the Bible, the Word of God, teaches that God's will and God's purpose for you is that you are Spirit-filled. Filled with His Spirit. If you aren't filled with the Spirit, then you're not walking in that which the Bible teaches and that which God has purposed and planned for you. Immediately after the glorious infilling with the Holy Spirit. And you can read about that in Acts chapter 2. There's some pretty cool stuff happening right there. Immediately after that time, we find this being said about Spirit-gifted followers of of Christ. Are you with me? We've walked you through the coming of the Christ child, a little bit about his pre-teen years, about the beginning of his earthly ministry, about the conclusion of his earthly ministry. And then he sent another a comforter. And when that comforter came on the day of Pentecost, immediately after that, we read this about the spirit-gifted followers of Christ, Acts 2:42. Look at this. They Devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Anybody getting this? What did they do? What did Jesus come to show them? What instructions did he leave them with? What's the first thing we see them doing here? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and all that other stuff stuff come later somebody's getting it they devoted themselves to discipleship and then all that other stuff began to unfold in their life discipleship Ooh. as important and urgent as it is to help others find Christ make no mistake about it this is not an anti-evangelism message this morning. If you take it that way, you haven't been listening. I believe in evangelism. I'm a product of evangelism. I owe my eternity to someone who cared enough about being a disciple and walking with Jesus and learning about Jesus and then conveying that to me so that I could begin that process, that experience in my own life. Oh, yeah, I believe in it. But, beloved, as important as that is, the necessary prerequisite for birthing a people into the body of Christ is following after Jesus and literally being a disciple. I think I can say this, and I didn't rehearse it. It just kind of jumped into my spirit. I can't think of anything that's any more detrimental to the growth of the church today than someone who isn't spirit-filled, and they haven't become a disciple of Christ, attempting to do evangelism for the church. Can I say that? Did that make sense? Did that come out right? Someone who isn't a disciple of Christ, attempting to win people to Christ. And the world's looking at them like, Pfft. 
you talking about? You're not even doing this thing. How can you tell me anything about it? Can you imagine me coming alongside young Tyler Moscarello and saying, Tyler, come, my lad. I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I want you to come with me. Might get you in big trouble. But uh, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. But uh, can you imagine? You can say that again. Good job, Tyler. Can you? Wouldn't he have to be like a total dipstick to follow me around if I told him that? How I many of you know there's some dipsticks in the world? What I've been talking to you about today, watch this, we're headed to the yellow sheet in your study notes. You had multiple study notes today. Pages and pages of study notes. What I've been talking to you about is a process. The process of discipleship. Paul distilled this entire concept into a very brief but logical order in his second letter to young Timothy. As young Tyler is to me, young Timothy was to Paul. I am not saying that I am like Paul or that I come up to the level of Paul or that young Tyler comes up to the level of Timothy. But then again, maybe I are saying those things when you understand the gifts that come from the Spirit of God. And Paul said this to his young protege, Timothy, you then, my son, chapter 2, verse, uh, chapter two, verse 1 of 2 Timothy, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, not in the power of the flesh, not what you think. But you be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Then look at verse 2. The things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Do you, you have your little yellow sheet with you? On that little yellow sheet you'll see several things. Over on this side, my left and your right probably. I don't know however, how that is when you're sitting there looking at it. Anyhow, there's a cross with a stick figure of Jesus hanging on it. You see that? And if it was in a living color like mine, then you'd see the blood coming from the, the crown. Jesus is on the cross. In the middle, just to the side of that, there's another stick figure. That represents meth and youth. Can you write meth under that? Then over on the far side, there's another stick figure, and he looks pretty happy. Mine looks happy. Does yours look happy? Happy, happy, happy. That would be your disciple. Here's the way this thing works. Here's what the Bible is laying out for us. Here's what discipleship is. Discipleship is listening to the teacher, watching the teacher, and then conveying what you are taught to reliable people. And it doesn't stop right there. Watch this, New Life. New Life needs to hear this. This is a critical stage in the life of New Life Community Church. It doesn't stop there. What has been learned, what has been taught, what has been observed, that is to be conveyed to another person and they are to be urged to be a qualified learner in the sense of conveying what they have learned to another qualified learner it's an endless process look at your little picture see that guy in the middle draw an air if you would and I would have put that on the screen but I'm, I didn't have this kind of art uh, capabilities on the screen draw a little air from the eye of that guy over to the cross and write eyes over the air on it. Then find his, his ears. They're hard to find. He's got little bitty ears. But they're there, trust me. If he turns sideways, you can see them. Draw an arrow from his ears over to the cross and write over that arrow. Ear. You see what he's doing? He's watching Jesus listening to Jesus and then after that that's step one after that draw a little arrow from his mouth over 
to that fellow that's smiling over there. You wondered why he was smiling. The reason he's smiling is because that guy in the middle is telling him about Jesus. And what he's telling him is about an experience that he is sharing with Jesus. That, beloved, is discipleship. And that is what Jesus came to accomplish. What he left us with. Now let me ask you this. Are you involved in the discipleship process? Far too many people in southwest Virginia of the United States of America embrace a philosophy that sounds something like this, and it sounds very spiritual. I've been saved, and that's all they're concerned about. I guess in their mind they think they did something, and, and they're going to live with God in heaven one of these days. I trust they are. What really needs to happen is we need to understand what really happened when the Christ child came and when he died on the cross and he went back to the Father and he sent Holy Spirit back. We need to understand what he left us to do. He left us to continue on what he was doing. Not just sitting around bragging about we're saved, but involved in the discipleship process walking with Jesus, listening to Jesus, learning about Jesus through his word and sharing that with others that we embrace. Does that make sense? Are you doing that? Are you involved in that process? If you're not, you could be and you should be. And you're given a multitude of opportunities at New Life Community Church. And If this don't trip your trigger, then maybe you can find another place where you can Serve the Lord. If you think you can't serve the Lord here, you need to be serving the Lord. Involved in what Jesus come. Pray with you. Well, beloved, we're going to wrap it up right there. That concludes this particular teaching, and I trust that you've learned some things about what it looks like to follow after Jesus. The long and the short of it is just this. We have to keep our eyes and our ears on Jesus in order to share the good news, to really become a fisher of men, to share the good news with others. The primary way that we do that in this day and age is by reading and studying God's Word, His love letters to each and every one of us. Keep your eyes on this, your ear on this, and learn how to pray. Learn how to communicate with God. And let me remind you tonight, prayer is communication. It's not just talking to God, just creating some kind of list and saying, okay, God, here's what I want you to do today. Kind of like God's the big Santa Claus in the sky. That's not the way it is at all. God has a purpose and plan for your life, and he wants to communicate that to you. And we need to learn to listen. Again, reading the Word, understanding the Word is a huge component of that equation. But learning to listen to that still, small voice, which you develop by a prayer life. Please be encouraged to spend some time every day of your life learning how to pray. In fact, the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. We'll save that for another day. It's been good having you with us tonight. We really appreciate you being here week after week. We want to remind you that New Life does have a regular schedule of services each and every Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Then our midweek, midweek services Wednesday at 7 o'clock, something for nearly every member of the family. Don't forget to check out our website, nlccalive.org. A lot of good, helpful information there. Well, I see that my time is gone. I've got to get out of here. I am Terry Knight, the pastor of New Life Community Church, wishing you a great week. And remember, my friends, if you don't live it, you don't have it.